The planetary system you explore in Outer Wilds is small, but it's oh so densely packed with wonder, both good and bad, and it offers more interesting sights and observations than games 18 quintillion times its size. It truly is a marvel. Out of Wilds captures the majesty and horror of space in all its terrifying glory. Out of Wilds is simultaneously beautiful and dangerous. You can be suffocating in space due to a lack of oxygen while being enraptured by the glorious view of two planets orbiting around each other as a huge tower of sand flows between them. One second you're walking upside down on ice thanks to nearby gravity crystals and the next you're falling into a black hole after getting a little too aggressive with your jetpack and missing a ledge. Or you can just sit next to your friend on a small moon and listen to him whistling a lovely tune without a care in the world. Outer Wilds mixes the spectacular with the mundane so smoothly that you're just as likely to want to track down the sound of a harmonica as you are the quantum signals that lead to objects which disappear when you're not looking at them. Outer Wilds is more of an outlier than it should be. After all, our own universe is a place of infinite possibilities. Our mere existence is a miracle of impossible to comprehend proportions, and yet the universe is so large that it's almost certainly a miracle that has been repeated elsewhere, likely many times already and many more to come. But video games have generally done a terrible job depicting the majesty, variety and horror of the universe. If we're lucky, planets might be distinguished by extreme weather conditions such as snow or sand, but just as often the differences come down to different coloured grass. Alien creatures often look a lot like our own, and strangely they are often present on multiple planets, as if a race of glorified dogs somehow developed a rudimentary system of space travel to move between planets, before giving up and spending the rest of their lives wandering around on all fours and shitting on funky looking grass. And god forbid any of these planets have tangible differences in gravity or planetary rotations. Outer Wilds is the exception. Its solar system may be small, but everything in it is worth exploring to uncover a touching story, to solve interesting puzzles, or even just sit back and watch as a planet crumbles before your eyes, losing a battle for survival with a black hole at its core. I've already said too much because the best part of Outer Wilds is discovering the madness for yourself. For that reason, this video will have two spoiler warnings. Before getting into any real spoiler territory, I'm going to try and sell you on the game, keeping the details as brief as I can, while still providing enough information to help you make a decision. Then I will give a spoiler warning and start including some spoilers more akin to what you'd see in a traditional review. This will include information you'd be better off discovering yourself, but it won't ruin the experience or anything. Then there will be another spoiler warning, at which point the entire game is up for discussion. Outer Wilds is an exploration and puzzle game, or perhaps an exploration puzzle game, because the two genres work in complete tandem here. You can only explore so far before you're confronted with a puzzle which opens up more areas to explore once you've solved it, and those new areas in turn might provide more puzzles or solutions to other puzzles. Outer Wilds feels a bit like the natural evolution of Mist, as you explore new locations, get stuck, go on to explore elsewhere, and then return to one of the tricky parts later. However, lest that comparison put you off, Outer Wilds is nowhere near as obtuse as Mist, which could be ridiculously cryptic at times and frankly cruel, in an era where puzzle solutions were not a quick Google search away. Mobius Digital wants you to solve Outer Wilds problems and see all the game has to offer. In fact, I can't think of a puzzle game that so desperately wants you to solve its puzzles without actually letting you skip them or holding your hand all the way through. The game even pulls out the tools you need automatically, so whenever you need to translate something, the translator will appear in your hand. Better still, if you find a building you can't get inside, the scout probe will pop up when you approach any window through which you could fire the probe. The game is telling you that you might want to take a closer look inside. Despite all this help, Outer Wilds can be tricky at times, but it gives you more than enough information to progress while still letting you be the one to process the information and come up with the solution. It's also briefly worth pointing out what Outer Wilds is not. It's not the witness in space, which I mention because it may look that way at times with these lights that you can move around with your cursor. I loved most of the witness, so I don't say this in a derogatory manner, but it was a fairly traditional puzzle game at heart. You were given a simple set of rules and then asked to implement them in increasingly challenging ways, at least until the end game stuff. They felt like pen and paper puzzles, a fancy digital collection of the sort of thing you used to find in a Sunday newspaper supplement. Outer Wilds has far fewer puzzles, but each is memorable. It's not interested in testing you ten times on the same concept when it can just test you twice and move on to something else. 
the problems feel a little more practical and are based on gravity, time and even quantum mechanics, not just how do you get a line from A to B following a set of arbitrary rules. And don't worry the quantum mechanics stuff isn't all that difficult. Oh and Outer Wilds is also not a survival game despite the fuel and oxygen meters, ship repairs and the like you might see on screen. You play as a Hearthian, so called because you are from the planet Timber Hearth, and the game starts on the day of your first voyage into space. You aren't the first Hearthian to go into space but it's still a relatively new concept, and there's an element of danger associated with it, not that you'd know that from the casual reactions of your fellow citizens. Before going into space you need to get the launch codes which in turn has you trekking around your town and potentially participating in a bunch of optional tutorials. While some of the kids seem excited, most people are fairly chill about your imminent adventure and you get the distinct impression that Slate for example is more interested in roasting another marshmallow than listening to tales of aliens and black holes. The Harthians understand space and space travel, they just don't make a big deal out of it. Once you have the launch codes you can jump in your ship and take off. Within seconds you're in space with 5 planets plus a bunch of asteroids, moons and space stations on your map and you're free to go wherever you like and you really can. No area is inherently any harder than the other so there's no right or wrong choice for where to start. Wherever you go your curiosity will be piqued by buildings or objects nearby so you'll land, wander over, find a small piece of story and roll from there. You could start on the nearby moon and track down a fellow Harthian or go straight to a strange comet called the Interloper. You don't even have to leave the starter planet immediately, there's plenty to explore at home. There's no obvious goal in mind initially although a clear end state does eventually present itself. At first your only motivation is your desire to see more of the nearby planets and then to uncover the story of the Nomai, the race of now extinct aliens that used to populate this system. Uncovering the history of the Nomai is truly fascinating thanks partly to how their fates are inextricably linked to the nature of the planets themselves. The Nomai built many of these structures you see and they have close connections to every planet. Understanding the Nomai is understanding the system and vice versa. The Nomai even help you solve the puzzles. Best of all though, the Nomai themselves are believable characters who communicate with you in a fun and relatable way. They aren't just an extinct race of aliens who leave behind dry and insufferable writings that you just collect in a journal and largely ignore. The Nomai writings all refer to other Nomai by name and they each have distinct personalities and voices. Their writings evidence feelings of excitement and fear, they joke and even flirt with each other. They debate the ethics of their actions and they manage to convey incredibly complicated principles in simple terms. I expect most people's prominent memories of Outer Wilds will revolve around the planets and puzzles but for me it's moments like watching a brother call someone out for flirting with his sister that form the most memorable moments and made me care about a group of people I only knew about through squiggles on a cave wall. Outer Wilds is accessible, charming and at times challenging and completely different to any other game I've played. It's a game that makes me feel clever one minute by letting me solve problems involving quantum mechanics and then stupid the next as I walk out of my ship without a spacesuit on. At between 15 to 20 hours it never overstays its welcome and will leave you thinking about it for a long time after completion. It's one of the best games I've ever played and my game of the year. Alright that's the end of the sales pitch part of the video. I highly recommend you stop watching now and go and play it, however if you want to know a little more but without full spoilers then keep watching. This is your first spoiler warning. And with that said, the big thing I was trying to keep hidden in the last section is something you likely already know. Outer Wilds works on a 22 minute time loop. You start each loop waking up from a peaceful sleep by the fire where you see an explosion around a distant planet and then you go about doing whatever it is you want to do. 22 minutes later the star at the centre of your system goes supernova and wipes out everything in the system. You wake up by the fire and start again. No one else is any the wiser, well no one except another Harthian on Giant's Deep called Grabo who is also aware of the loop but is perfectly content to spend his time relaxing on or above his hammock. You and Grabo were singled out by Know My Statues during that introduction when it turned to look at you with ominous blue eyes. Whenever you die, either due to the supernova or an accident, you see the statue and your memories from the last 22 minutes flash before your eyes. The only thing you keep from each loop is information, both personally as the player and in your ship's log. There is absolutely no system of upgrades either to your spaceship or character, no shortcuts to unlock and no permanent changes to the world. Every 22 minutes the entire system is reset to exactly as it was except for the ship's log. 
If this sounds like some kind of harsh roguelite or roguelike experience, then fret not, Outer Wilds is absolutely not one of those. Each death is hardly a punishment at all, more a chance to reset and tackle things from a fresh perspective. Quite often, dying and starting back on Timber Hearth next to your ship is a quicker way to get to another planet than backtracking to your ship from wherever you ended up on the previous run. Death was sometimes a punishment for my mistakes, but it wasn't a punishment for my curiosity. 22 minutes is a lot longer than it sounds, so you'll rarely find the supernova stopping you in your tracks. This is going to sound cliche, and I'm even rolling my own eyes as I say this, but you really do learn something on every run. By that I mean you learn something tangible and useful. I don't mean in the traditional roguelite sense where you play for 90 minutes and learn that oh you don't have enough invincibility frames to get through that attack or oops using that item actually kills you, better remember for next time. Learning in Outer Wilds is gaining actual knowledge that you will use on the next run to unlock something new. Looking back through my footage I only found two runs where I stayed alive the full 22 minutes without finding information that changed the way I approached the next run. That explains why the time loop isn't a pain in the ass, but when a game includes a core feature like this, it needs to do more than just not be annoying to justify its existence. It needs to add something positive to the experience, and the time loop in Outer Wilds does that many times over. Before continuing I want to point out that I would not be comparing Outer Wilds to Majora's Mask. Not because I'm actually capable of analysing games on their own merits, I'm certainly not above throwing cheap comparisons around if it helps, but because I haven't played Majora's Mask and I don't intend to. I'm aware that Majora's Mask may have done some of these things already, but I'm also aware that Zelda games are fundamentally boring and overrated. The time loop in Outer Wilds is crucial to the experience because nearly every location you can visit undergoes significant changes during the 22 minutes. This goes well beyond needing to meet a certain NPC in a certain place at a certain time. During the 22 minute loop in Outer Wilds, Brittle Hollow almost completely collapses into the black hole at its core, with its pieces ending up floating around a white hole at the edge of the system. On Ash Twin and Ember Twin, known collectively as the Hourglass Twins, all the sand from one ends up on the other, completely transforming the landscapes of both. Ice on the interloper melts and freezes again as it gets closer and further from the sun. These changes provide some spectacular views, but the real payoff is in the puzzles. I won't spoil the complicated stuff yet, but at a basic level you might need to think about when you attempt to access locations. So for example if you need to get somewhere on Brittle Hollow you might find it easier if you do it before half of the planet and the platforms you need to stand on are swallowed up by a black hole. If you need to get inside a building on Ash Twin you might have to wait until some of the sand has made its way to Ember Twin to clear the way. The 22 minutes allotted to each run also makes sense when you consider the size of the planets and the system. I must admit when I first took off I was a little disappointed with how small everything was. The system here feels like a glorified science project. You can imagine the planet supported on wires and your ship, which is a rough collection of spare parts and probably held together by what I hope is strong sellotape, is probably flying around on a piece of string held up by a young kid. It feels like you're watching the results of someone playing around with toys like in the Lego movie, and that feeling never quite goes away, but I did cease to care about it, and I eventually appreciated the smaller scope. You can land on any planet within a minute of taking off, and once there it won't take long to get to where you need to go. Even outside of the ship you can run around the planets in a minute or two. By the time you've solved a simple puzzle and explored the environment for all the written and visual clues available, you'll have used up most of your 22 minutes and be ready to go somewhere else or take a fresh look at the ship log to see what further mysteries you've revealed. And that ship log will be your best friend. I'm sure it sounds a little silly to make a big deal out of what is essentially a glorified journal, but Outer Wilds would be a lesser game without it, and it nearly was. According to an interview with Alex Beecham for US Gamer, as of February 2018, Outer Wilds didn't have the ship log, and playtesters reported that they were confused as to where to go and what to do at any given time. After talking it over with his team, Beecham decided to add what were effectively the design notes for the game's puzzles into the ship itself. The ship log is incredible. Whenever you discover new information or even rumours, a new entry is added to the log and it's all linked in this easy to understand chart. When you first hear about the orbital probe cannon, an entry is added to the log as a question mark and clicking on this shows the associated rumours. Following the rumours leads you to the cannon at which point you will find the three modules, the control module, launch module and the probe tracking module, and these in turn are added to the log as question marks and then filled in once you've explored them. The four major mysteries are each colour coded, although ultimately they do end up blending together. 
As I said, Out of Wilds wants you to uncover its secrets, and as such it makes it clear when you've missed something from a given location. This is essential not just to completing the game, but to understanding and appreciating it. More than once I found myself spending 10 solid minutes just staring at this mind map, wrapping my head around the discoveries made in the last run and working out how they're linked to what I had already uncovered. This is challenging enough to do with the ship log. We're talking about a game with quantum mechanics, warp holes and long dead alien races after all. Oh, and the story is told in a non-linear fashion because you can go wherever you want from the start, so there's no telling when a player will stumble upon each piece of information. The log is crucial, and I hope other developers make more effort with their in-game journals in future instead of just listing quests under different headings. Without this log, I wouldn't have grasped the detail so clearly, and the ending wouldn't have had the same impact as a result. And the ending really did hit hard in ways I wasn't expecting for a story about an extinct species. No matter what planet you go to first, you start uncovering information about the Nomai, a race of three-eyed aliens who arrived in this system following a signal from what they call the Eye of the Universe. Unlike the Harthians, the Nomai are a curious bunch. Exploration is in their blood, it's a calling, a desire impossible to ignore. Unfortunately, in this case, the hunt for the Eye led to their vessel crashing into a strange entity known as Dark Bramble. Three escape pods were launched, landing on various planets throughout the system. Although the Nomai aren't the type to settle down, they realised that the only way to continue the hunt for the Eye would be to lay down roots in this system, and work together to build a society that would eventually be capable of creating the technology to find the Eye. And so they did. You can find traces of their civilizations all over the system. What happened to them, however, is a bigger mystery. As are the black rocks that move when you look away from them, and the weird device around Giant's Deep. Not to mention the location of the crashed vessel, the contraption orbiting the nearby star, and whatever weird experiment was taking place at the Hourglass Twins. The puzzles in Outer Wilds are mainly about gathering and understanding information about the Nomai and the world around you. Early on, many paths are locked off either through literal locked doors or insurmountable environmental obstacles, but clues elsewhere will typically point you in the direction of a secret path to your destination. As you progress, you'll need a much deeper understanding of the game's systems and tools. For example, the scout probe is useful for taking pictures of what lies ahead down certain paths or in rooms you can't reach, but it also provides a signal for you to track which can be useful when dealing with objects that don't necessarily stay in one place. Even the traditional puzzle sections are there as a learning tool more than an arbitrary test you must pass. Remember, you don't technically have to beat any puzzles to complete the game. Outer Wilds is about learning, and so are the puzzles. In the Tower of Quantum Trials, you're tested on your understanding of quantum objects and how they move around when unobserved. You move from floor to floor with progressively tougher puzzles in one of the only times Outer Wilds felt anything like a traditional puzzle game. The last puzzle was tense and I only just about beat it when the star went supernova. It was only later that I realised I didn't actually need to beat the puzzle. There was no notable reward for doing so other than a bit of information from my log that I could have lived without. If I'd failed I would have been just as equipped to tackle the next challenge as I was after succeeding. This lack of pressure means the music that starts playing just as the star is about to go supernova ends up being joyfully melancholic. Even if you were busy doing something, there's a temptation to stop, listen and chill out as the star explodes around you. The music is so relaxing that even if you have time to go elsewhere, you might be tempted to whip out the signal scope and tune in to Outer Wilds Ventures and listen to Feldspar playing the harmonica or Esker whistling. Outer Wilds is a game with so few negatives that I'm struggling to think of any valid criticisms. The visuals won't be to everyone's taste, I suppose. I mean, I love it, with the exception of parts like the Tower of Sand or the Cyclones, where things can look a little rough once you're inside them or up close. I suppose the game could have used a more in-depth tutorial on controlling your ship, especially when it comes to traversing from planet to planet. It's surprising how early you have to start slowing down when approaching a planet, so more often than not I would use the autopilot, although even that has issues and it won't hesitate to send you directly into the sun if your goal happens to be on the other side. I appreciate that flying a spaceship should be challenging, but come on, it's not rocket science. 
Landing can be a bit fiddly as well, but it really doesn't matter all that much. You can repair the ship in seconds and the 22 minute timer means you often only need to use it once per run anyway. So yeah, you should absolutely buy and play Outer Wilds if you haven't already. Everyone has different sensitivity to spoilers, but if you think knowing about the secrets in Outer Wilds would negatively affect your enjoyment in any way, then stop watching now. This is your final spoiler warning. One of the most impressive parts about Outer Wilds, and the reason I want to get into spoiler territory, is the way all the separate threads link together in the story, and how natural the discovery process is. As a reminder, the four separate stories marked in your log revolve around the orbital cannon that explodes around Giant's Deep at the start of each loop, the location of the Nomai vessel that brought them to this system in the first place, the mysterious quantum objects, and the Nomai project on the Hourglass Twins. Despite being scattered across the system when their ship crashed and when they launched their escape pods, the Nomai never gave up on their plan to reach the Eye of the Universe. They knew the Eye must be close because of the Quantum Moon. The Quantum Moon moves locations when it's not being observed, hanging out at each of the five major planets in the system. However, it occasionally disappears completely. The Nomai theorised that the mysterious sixth location is the Eye of the Universe itself, and therefore the Eye must be close. Unfortunately, close in the context of space still leaves a hell of a lot of room for error and their attempts at tracking the moon to this sixth location all fail. The Nomai considered launching a probe into deep space, but the chances of them finding the eye with one probe were slim, and the resources and power required to launch a probe to the outskirts of the system meant it wasn't something that could be easily replicated. Their first major breakthrough was the discovery of a wormhole that transports people from one end of the system to the other. The entrance to this wormhole is the black hole at the centre of Brittle Hollow, and the exit is the white hole at the edge of the system. The Nomai adapted this technology to create their own warp points, which let them move between the various planets, ensuring that the initially separate groups of Nomai were able to work together once again. The warps were also used to transport raw materials such as metal ore between planets. The Nomai were careful not to completely strip planets of raw materials. Noting for example that Timber Hearth had a race of four-eyed creatures currently living in the oceans, but that one day might evolve to live on the land. This warp technology led to another major discovery. One day a Nomai used the warp drive and the instruments detected that he somehow arrived at the exit shortly before he'd entered. The time difference in arriving and departing was almost imperceptible, and initially the Nomai thought their instruments must just be faulty, but after further tests they proved that the warp holes do indeed send you back in time ever so slightly. This gave them an idea. What if that element of time travel could be boosted to something more practical, like say, 22 minutes? In 22 minutes the Nomai could send a probe out to any given location to have it look for the eye of the universe, and then the probe could send the information back to the Nomai using the warp technology. This information would reach the Nomai 22 minutes before it was sent, and crucially before the probe was launched. If the probe didn't find the eye, which it likely wouldn't, then the coordinates could be changed and the probe would be sent to a different part of space, where again it would send the results back in time. This would be repeated as long as necessary. There's just one tiny problem with this plan. The amount of energy required to create a time differential of 22 minutes is enormous, and the Nomai determined that the only way they can generate the amount of power required to send information back 22 minutes is to cause the sun to go supernova. The Nomai really want to reach the eye of the universe, so they went ahead and built a stun station to blow up the sun. It's not quite as bad as it sounds because the Nomai also built a failsafe in the form of the Nomai statues that would record people's memories so that they would know they're in a time loop. The Nomai statues would kick in when the project was successful and the eye had been located, and those captured in the loop would then retrieve the coordinates of the eye and deactivate the sun station before it had blown up the sun. In theory it would be like the sun had never blown up at all. Even so, the Nomai in charge of the project had huge reservations and doubts about the ethics of what they were doing. A probe cannon was developed, however due to the power required for that it was installed in orbit around Giant Steep, ensuring no energy would be wasted by the probe needing to escape the planet's gravity. There's an amusing conversation between the developers of the probe and those who end up using it. The developers realise that their friends will likely push the power levels beyond the accepted bounds, so they deliberately reduce the recommended power level. However, those using the device predicted that the other Nomai would have accounted for their enthusiastic nature and went ahead and ignored it. That's why the cannon then blows up when the probe is launched. Everything was ready to go, except the sun station didn't work. 
There was nothing else the Nomai could do. They carried on as before, presumably trying to think of other ways to reach the Eye of the Universe, but they never made it. The closest they could get to the Eye of the Universe was by travelling to the Quantum Moon, which became a sort of rite of passage for Nomai youth. The Nomai have one more story to tell. Three Nomai travel to the Interloper, the comet in orbit in this system. After making it to the centre they find a large mass of ghost matter, a deadly substance that kills on contact. One of the Nomai stays behind to document the problem and another tries to leave to warn the others. He's too late. The core explodes, spreading ghost matter throughout the system and wiping out all life in the process. The Nomai, in this system at least, are no more. I'm not quite sure why the interloper is still intact given that the core exploded, but I guess the ghost matter could have travelled throughout the system without destroying the comet itself. If I'm missing something here, let me know in the comments. Anyway, the ghost matter doesn't quite wipe out all life in the system. Presumably it doesn't travel through water because the early Harthians survive, and over 200,000 years later they evolve into what we see today. Mind you, if the ghost matter can't travel through water, how did it get through the ice in the comet? Like I said, I'm a bit confused on this part. And that finally brings us to the events of the game, where the orbital probe cannon is kickstarted into life by the sun going into supernova at the end of its natural life. Actually, the orbital probe cannon started a while ago and we just don't remember the first loop, or the second, or even the second thousandth. Using the energy from the expanding sun, which is actually expanding slowly in the game world by the way, the orbital probe cannon has already launched over 9,000 probes into space trying to find the eye of the universe, and then it succeeds. On the 9,534th attempt, the probe finds the eye of the universe and sends the signal back in time, which activates the Know My Statues, one of which happens to choose you because, well, you're the closest. Under the original plan, as the Know My envisioned it, you would now deactivate the sun station and travel to the eye. Except it wasn't the sun station that caused the supernova. The supernova is a natural event and it's going to wipe out all life in the system unless you can stop it. You track down the coordinates for the eye of the universe, grab a warp core and hook it up to the original Nomai vessel to travel to the eye of the universe itself. But there's nothing you can do. You can't stop a supernova. The system is going to get obliterated and eventually so too will all the other systems and galaxies in the universe. At the eye of the universe you watch as all stars, planets and life forms are wiped out. Presumably this is actually happening over a long period of time mind you. I don't think the entire universe disappears in one instant. It was on its last legs though. The Hearthians were simply unlucky enough to have evolved right before its star was due to go supernova. As with the quantum moon, the eye of the universe needs to be observed. It can't do anything without people around to watch it, and so you and representations of the friends you made along the way all gather around the fire, play a song and watch as the eye creates a new universe right in front of you. An epilogue shows us a glimpse of 14.3 billion years into the future as new life is starting to evolve. It really is an incredible tale, and one that wouldn't have been possible were it not for the work of the Nomai. They may not have lived long enough to see the eye of the universe for themselves, but without their efforts we would never have made it to the eye and been able to help bring about a new universe. I'm not sure what I was expecting when I first saw these cute four-eyed blue people sat around a campfire roasting marshmallows, or when I travelled to the nearby moon to listen to a song under the stars, or hung out with grabos surrounded by cyclones, but it wasn't the inevitable death of all life in the system as the sun exploded. Reaching the eye of the universe was a huge moment. It wasn't a surprise in the traditional sense, I mean it was obvious where we were heading, and yet after landing on the eye and taking a look around I genuinely had to pause the game just to give myself a minute to take it all in. This moment and the story in general wouldn't have been so impactful if it weren't for the beautiful and gradual way the information is drip fed out over the course of 15 plus hours. In each loop you go into space equipped only with a translator, scout probe and signal scope, and yet this is all you need to solve the wonders of this solar system. My favourite section by far was learning the rules of quantum mechanics. The quantum rocks, which it turns out are part of the quantum moon, are introduced during the tutorial when you explore Timber Hearth. The first lesson imparted by these rocks is that they move when you aren't looking at them. Using your signal scope you can track down quantum rocks on other planets and learn new lessons such as how if you're in contact with a quantum rock and in complete darkness you will travel with the rock to its new location. We also learn that the quantum rocks can affect nearby objects. So in one section you can progress either by turning your flashlight off and on again or just spin in a circle to make supposedly impassable objects disappear. 
The best rule is the one taught in the quantum trials, namely that looking at a quantum object and a picture of a quantum object are the same thing. Using this knowledge you can effectively keep a quantum object in place by taking a picture of it with your scout probe. A thorough understanding of these quantum rules is essential to land on the quantum moon and then to successfully transport it to the sixth location around the eye of the universe. As with all good puzzles there are moments where you're stumped only to stumble on the solution that with hindsight was incredibly obvious, such as when I needed to make it into a tower on Brittle Hollow, the planet with the black hole at the middle. I tried getting to the planet early to see if there were any new pathways that I needed to use before they got destroyed but no. I tried going there late in case the destruction of the planet created an opening but that didn't work either. It was an embarrassingly long time before I realised that the tower itself was one of the items that was collapsing into the black hole, and that if I followed it in I would be able to access the tower from the corresponding white hole. You have to adopt a similar approach when looking for a vessel in the Dark Bramble, a mysterious planet with a seemingly infinite core. White lights lead you to the next zone although they are also used by the anglerfish to lure you in. Many of these zones are effectively dead ends and one wrong turn means you will be stuck in a never ending loop. Therefore when you find the third escape pod and a connection to the vessel, you should fire a scout probe through and follow its trail. These anglerfish represent one of my few gripes with the puzzles in Outer Wilds. On a couple of occasions such as these anglerfish or the inner zone in Giant's Deep, your progression is blocked until you find the information you need somewhere else. This effectively creates a roadblock to one story path and forces you onto another to get what you need. I'm fine with this in principle and sometimes it works rather well. For example the only way to get closer to the core in Giant's Deep is to note that while most of the cyclones are spinning clockwise and throw you up into space, some are spinning anti-clockwise and will shoot you down past the barrier that's in your way. I thought this was really good because if you were especially observant there's a chance you would notice that some cyclones are spinning the other way and perhaps experiment with them. Failing that the solution does get spelled out for you elsewhere. Similarly there are warp towers on Ash Twin. These towers around the equator all send you to another destination. You'll likely learn how warp towers work by falling into the black hole and stumbling into the only thing you can access in deep space and noting that you can warp to another place just by looking up at the ceiling when the destination planet is aligned with the roof. From here you might realise that the towers on Ash Twin represent other planets and each has a ceiling that looks like the one in the white hole station. If you don't notice you'll again have it spelled out to you later. In the case of these cyclones and the warp zones in Ash Twin you could stumble upon the solution by accident, either by going into the one cyclone that happens to be spinning anti-clockwise or by looking up at just the right time in the right place, however it's unlikely. Unfortunately with other puzzles Mobius Digital seems to be overly paranoid that the player might stumble upon the correct answer by chance, and it makes things incredibly annoying and fiddly to compensate. Take those anglerfish. The first time you try to reach the vessel you will likely pass through a pod and straight into three of the fish. You might be able to back up in time but chances are you'll be eaten and have to start again. Similarly you won't be able to get to the core of Giant's Deep without knowing how to get past the electricity surrounding it. It was a long time before I found the solutions to these and when I did it was a bit underwhelming. The anglerfish are blind and therefore you can get past them by not making any noise and you can get into the electric sphere by hiding away inside of jellyfish. I guess the problem Mobius was worried about with these solutions is that players could find them by accident. The fish are often asleep anyway when you first see them so it's natural for you to stay quiet and make your way past them. Likewise the jellyfish will probably attract your interest so you might try to swim inside them anyway. In order to stop you getting past these obstacles by accident Mobius decides to make the whole thing awkward instead. The anglerfish are all blocking the entrance in a way that makes it incredibly difficult to get past them, even if you do know you have to stay silent. Weirdly though you can basically clip through them. The jellyfish are also fiddly enough that the first time I tried to get inside I just ended up getting electrocuted and thought perhaps I had to do it while in the ship but that didn't work either. I got there in the end of course it was just more annoying than it should have been. With these puzzles I knew exactly what I had to do and yet the game wouldn't let me do it. Likewise there's the quantum moon. To land on the moon you must have a picture of the moon visible when you approach, otherwise you'll just fly straight through it. This is because quantum objects have to be observed, except if you're flying straight into the moon you kind of are observing it by default, so why can't you land on it without a picture? The answer is that the game doesn't want you doing this until you know the quantum rule about observation and this is its solution. My only other puzzle complaint is that there can be the odd bit of time wasting such as when you have to wait for certain towers to become available or for sand to fill up before you can move on. 
These are the exceptions and not the rules though. In fact, if you do find yourself having to wait around, there's a good chance you actually need to go and do something else first, such as moving the black hole tower into position before warping there. As you get near the end of Outer Wilds, you do start to see how the sausage was made a touch. I loved how the story came together no matter where you started your adventure, but one of the major ways it does this is by including the same information in multiple places on the projection stones, which is effective but a bit dull. But then you see how much effort and flavour text surrounds every little thing. For example, you aren't just told that the anglerfish are blind through a random note. You discover how the children used to play a game where one of them would be an anglerfish and chase the others, and how they ended up incorporating the anglerfish's blindness into their game, which the parents found cute. The jellyfish secret was revealed because someone was determined to experiment with them as a food source first. Outer Wilds provides many little moments like this. The exploration leads to puzzles, which leads to little details about the Nomai and lives long since snuffed out. With the exception of duplicate text and a couple of puzzles, I can't think of any wasted time in Outer Wilds. I enjoyed reading every line of Nomai conversation and checking out every new building. It's densely packed in a way that so few open-ended games manage to be, and credit must go to Kelsey Beecham for the consistently high quality writing. Outer Wilds makes most other space games feel tame or at least uninteresting by comparison. You can hop from platform to platform above an all-consuming black hole, wait for the sands of time to trickle from one planet to the next until all its secrets are revealed, or explore the inside of the comet that wiped out all life in the system. Or you can just sit down next to Slate and cook marshmallows over the fire, waiting for the inevitable blue blast of the supernova to consume you all. There's no bad way to spend each 22 minutes in Outer Wilds. Whatever you do is bound to enchant. If you've made it to the end of this video, then hopefully that means you've already played Outer Wilds, but if you've been a little naughty and watched it anyway, I implore you to play this game. It is absolutely incredible. It's my game of the year without a doubt. An unbelievable experience that is hard to put into words, hence I bumbled my way through this video. If I've convinced even one person to buy it, the whole thing has been worth it. On that note, if you enjoyed the video, please consider hitting like, subscribing and sharing wherever appropriate for a few new eyes on the video. And don't forget to let me know what you thought in the comments, especially if you know what the deal is with Dark Bramble. I feel like I've missed a bunch of information about the nature of that planet and its existence. Also let me know how many times I accidentally referred to Outer Wilds as the Outer Worlds. I have a Patreon if you feel like donating. This gets your name in the credits and a Patreon role in my Discord server, which is open to all. I should be able to get out another video in December. January will hopefully see the return of the History of Isometric CRPG series, and then I will finally get the Witcher 3 video done. Okay, until next time, cheers.